Cannabis has been used as medicine by nearly every major civilization for the last 5,000 years. And it's really only over the last 100 years that cannabis has been made illegal throughout the world and research into it has been banned. Today, the legalization of cannabis is one of the greatest social experiments of our lifetime. And like any experiment, questions often outweigh answers. Depending on who you ask, cannabis is a miraculous panacea, nothing more than a mere placebo or a dangerous poison. So today, I'm gonna to separate fact from fiction about cannabis and help lead you to this counterintuitive idea that this conversation isn't even just about cannabis, but it's about an entire coming revolution in the way that we look at the molecules inside food and plants as medicine. So let's start off by taking a look at what's under the hood of cannabis. So cannabis is the only plant in the world that produces compounds called cannabinoids. The most abundant cannabinoid is called tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. And it's responsible for the psychoactivity of cannabis. It's what makes you feel high. The second most abundant cannabinoid in cannabis is called cannabidiol, CBD. Now, cannabidiol is actually non-psychoactive. If you took it, you're not actually going to feel high. And cannabidiol arguably has a much wider range of medical uses than THC. But it doesn't just end there. There's over 90 other cannabinoids in cannabis, and we're barely scratching the surface of what these compounds do. It's an area of active research. So a panacea is a drug that can treat a variety of ailments. It's a so-called cure-all. And for some, cannabis fits this bill. But for the longest time, we didn't even know why cannabis affected humans. And it wasn't until the 1990s that scientists finally discovered why. It's called the endocannabinoid system. Endo meaning internal, cannabinoid meaning cannabis-like. Your body's own internal system of cannabis molecules and receptors. And this system is ancient and primitive. It evolved over 200 million years ago. And it's not just present in your brain. It's present throughout your body as well. It's on your immune cells. It's on your skin cells. It's in your organs. It's everywhere. And even more fascinating, all vertebrates make endocannabinoids. Amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, fish, they all produce cannabis-like molecules in their body. And it's not a surprise, because this system is present throughout your body, that it has a wide variety of functions. So some of these functions of the endocannabinoid system might make sense to you if you know the reasons that people use cannabis or the, reason, the effects that they report. So things like pain, appetite, stress, and sleep. Now there's some other functions of the endocannabinoid system that you might not necessarily guess. It's also involved in metabolism and immune function. Here's a quote I want to show you. Targeting endocannabinoid system activity may have therapeutic potential in nearly all diseases affecting humans. All diseases affecting humans. And this is not fringe science. This is actually coming out of our government's own National Institutes of Health, who've been doing research into the endocannabinoid system for over a decade. So on one hand, we have the endocannabinoid system. And if we can manipulate the system properly, we could theoretically affect all diseases affecting mankind. On the other hand, we have cannabis and cannabinoids, of which there's only a few scientifically accepted medical uses. That includes the use of cannabis for nausea, for anorexia, which is when you're not gaining enough weight, muscle spasms, when you have painful involuntary muscle contractions, and lastly, chronic pain. So there's a disconnect here. And part of that disconnect is because cannabis is a Schedule I drug. It's been incredibly difficult to do research on it for almost a century. But I'm hopeful. And in my future, I see that there's a coming wave of a cannabis scientific renaissance. And one of the molecules that I'm particularly excited about is CBD. So here's another quote. Let me walk you through this. So CBD, this is that non-psychoactive chemical in cannabis. It can be useful for seizures. It can be useful as an antioxidant, like resveratrol that we find in wine. 
It's a neuroprotectant that can be used in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It's an anti-inflammatory that can be used in autoimmune disorders like lupus or Crohn's disease. It's an analgesic that can be used in pain. It has anti-tumor properties, that is, it directly kills cancer cells. It has antipsychotic properties that could be used in schizophrenics, and it could also be used in anxiety. Now, we have to take all of this with a grain of salt. This is all very preliminary research. It's only been done in animals, so we don't know if it'll pan out in humans. But contrast this with the seemingly miraculous anecdotal data we hear from people who use cannabis. We have to take all of that anecdotal data with a grain of salt as well. And that's because of something called the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is when your positive expectations about a treatment actually make that treatment seem more effective than it actually is. So for example, this is if you have back pain and I give you a sugar pill and I tell you this will help your back pain and you take it and you go, whoa, it does actually help my back pain. That's the placebo effect in action. And in fact, for cannabis, the placebo effect is even stronger than that for other compounds. And that's for a few reasons. So people who are using cannabis, they're often using it for subjective things, things like pain or mood. And whenever you have subjective outcomes in a patient, the placebo effect is going to be heightened. Moreover, cannabis is psychoactive. So when you give someone cannabis, they feel different, and they feel it immediately. And because they feel different, they think the cannabis is working, and that's going to increase the placebo effect even more. And lastly, cannabis has this miraculous reputation. So going in, you have this immense expectation that it's going to benefit you. And so you are actually going to feel like it did benefit you. So here's a case in point. This is a gentleman with Parkinson's who's taking a concentrated cannabis extract for his tremors. You can see within a few minutes if tremors have subsided. Seems miraculous, right? This video on YouTube has millions of views, and there's countless other stories from patients like it. But where does the science add up? Well, when we did a recent clinical study of CBD for Parkinson's, we found that CBD was no better than placebo for tremors in Parkinson's patients. So my advice to you is you have to be skeptical. You have to be skeptical like this skeptical chihuahua. Okay, he's very skeptical. And you have to be skeptical of anecdotal data, but especially anecdotal data when it comes to cannabis because cannabis has such an increased placebo response. So now what if cannabis isn't just a neutral placebo? What if it's actually a dangerous poison? Well, first, let's kind of compare it to some other dangerous substances that we encounter here in America. So tobacco kills about half a million Americans a year. Alcohol and opioids kill about 30,000 people a year. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like aspirin or ibuprofen, kill about 10,000 Americans a year. What does that number look like for cannabis? Zero. Zero recorded overdoses or direct deaths due to cannabis. And not just in one year, in the history of civilization, we've yet to have a single one. Now the reason I put a question mark next to that zero is that I am sure there have been indirect deaths caused by cannabis. For example, if you're intoxicated on cannabis, your odds of getting in a car accident are doubled. And so I guarantee you there's people who have died as a result of that. But even if we account for all of this, we can see that that number is still really low. And arguably, cannabis is safer than things like aspirin or ibuprofen, which we consider to be safe. It's sold over the counter. We give these things to our children. But there is a dark side to the amount of deaths caused by cannabis. I want you to look at this number. This is not a joke. 230 billion. Those are the amounts of lives of Cheetos lost every year because of cannabis intoxication. <laughs> it's a travesty, it's an epidemic. We need to protect Cheetos from the dangers of cannabis. You know, 
But all jokes aside, there are some serious risks, risks for cannabis that we should be aware of. So schizophrenia. In people who have a genetic risk for schizophrenia, using cannabis early and heavily in life is going to increase the odds that they actually develop schizophrenia in their lifetime. Women who use cannabis during pregnancy tend to give birth to babies who are lower in birth weight. People who begin using cannabis heavily and early on in life during adolescence, they tend to go on to have lower IQ, lower educational status, lower income. Now, the one caveat there is that often these individuals are also using other substances, particularly alcohol and tobacco. And we think a lot of the detriments are actually being driven by that. But this is still an area of concern for parents. What about the issue of dependence or addiction? So there's some that might say cannabis isn't addictive, and that's just not true. In fact, 9% of people who try cannabis will go on to become addicted to it at some point in their lifetime. Now, that 9% figure is lower than that of other substances. For alcohol, it's 16% of people will go on to become addicted. For heroin, it's 24%. For nicotine, it's 32%. So while cannabis might be less addictive than these other substances, it is still addictive for a small minority of people. We need to be aware of that. Now what about the effects of cannabis on cognitive function and memory in adults who start using, not adolescents? Well, we also find that you do see mild deficits in certain forms of cognition and certain forms of memory in adults who start becoming regular users. But the reason I put that in yellow and not red is that these are not permanent detriments. It appears that when you stop using the cannabis, within about 30 days, those mild deficits self-correct and you go back to normal. And lastly, on the issue of lung disease, we find that even people who are heavy, long-term smokers of cannabis are not at an increased risk for lung cancer or serious lung disorders. And it could be possibly due to the anti-tumor and the anti-inflammatory properties of cannabinoids. We're not sure. These are longitudinal studies that are retrospective. It's very hard to say. Now, on the issue of cannabis being a gateway drug, this is the hypothesis that although cannabis might not be very dangerous, it leads people to use other drugs that are indeed harmful and dangerous. And for the most part, this gateway theory has been debunked. But I think cannabis is a different type of gateway. I think it's a gateway, I think it's a gateway herb. And you see, the market size of cannabis in America is 100 times larger than the size of that of echinacea or ginkgo biloba or turmeric. And so I say cannabis is a gateway herb that is going to precipitate a revolution in how we look at the compounds in food and plants as medicine and as part of our health and wellness. So at the end of the day, is cannabis a panacea, a placebo, or a poison? Well, it appears that it's all of these things. It just depends on who you are, what condition you're using it for, which cannabinoid you're using, and at which dosage. And the only way to really tease this apart is to do good scientific research. But like we mentioned earlier, it's incredibly difficult. Cannabis is a Schedule I drug. It's arguably the single hardest substance to study in our country. Moreover, traditional sources of funding aren't available for cannabis research. The government will not fund cannabis research. So what can we do? Well, if this is an area you're passionate about, as citizens, we have to fund the research ourselves. And that's through micro donations so that we can crowdfund cannabis research and finally start teasing this apart. And only through good scientific research can we start to unravel the mysteries of this gateway herb and usher in a revolution and how we look for medically useful compounds in food and in plants. Thank you.